Welcome to the PBC 2020 NBA Draft Remote Film Room. My name is John Chepkevich, Director of Scouting for the PBC, and joining me today is all Big Ten big man and 2020 NBA Draft early entrant, Caleb Wesson. What's going on, Caleb? How's it going? Hey, going pretty well, man. Uh, hope you're doing all right. I hear you're down in Houston, Texas, getting some work in for your pre-draft. How's everything going there? Feel like you're making some progress? Yeah, it's good. You know, a lot of stuff we're working on mobility and stuff, just making sure I'm available, injury prevention, stuff like that. And, you know, just a lot of good work. You know, Houston's really open right now. So. Yeah, no, that's good, man. I'm glad to hear that you're able to make some good use of this time and put in some work in spite of all the kind of craziness that's surrounding this pre-draft process here. And uh, so that's really good to hear. Unfortunately, you won't really get the opportunity, it looks like, to really travel to teams facilities and get that sort of intimate environment in front of front office decision makers where you could kind of show your skills and really, uh, you know, prop yourself up against some of the high rated bigs in this class and show what you're made of. But, you know, while that may not be the case, wanted to kind of take this opportunity now to do something a little bit different and dig into your game film and just talk through how you see the game, how you read the game, some of the strengths that you bring to the table that will translate really cleanly to the NBA, maybe a couple minor areas for improvement. Does that sound good? Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course, man. All right, let's get into it. So we're going to start with your strengths on the offensive side of the ball. And, you know, what really stuck out to me is your ability to facilitate offense for the rest of your team. So in the numbers, it might not stick out that you average about two assists per game, but you have really good vision working from the elbows and keeping your head up and kind of drawing guys in toward you because you're a good outside shooting threat and kind of finding these little angles for cutters and things like that. Do you want to maybe speak to this play specifically, kind of what you saw here and how you helped uh, open up this angle to pass it to this cutter here? Yeah, you know, Dwayne, great player, you know, so they got to they gotta respect his ability to score the ball, so they got to chase him over those screens. And, yeah. you know, what we worked in was kind of me and Dwayne just rescreening. You know, they're right. going to go over, they can go over again. You know, just me being able to use my body especially on that play to get, help him uh, get a, just a little advantage that he needs. Right. <laughs> you know, he gave me the ability to give it to him and he finished the play. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's particularly interesting and unique because like you're setting a screen with the ball in your hands here, right? Like yeah. you're, you're, it's kind of like a little bit of a DHO action, but you don't actually hand it off and just kind of, you know, spread yourself wide, use your body to, create that separation for him. And you don't see a lot of guys that are able to do that and then have the vision afterwards to make such a good pass. So, you know, it was a particularly interesting play, I thought. And then as we get through to these next clips, we'll see a few more kind of similar to them with your passing vision. So here we'll see, start by having a nice box out on the defensive end. Then you run the court down here and seal this guy off. Now, when you catch it on this block here, What's going through your head when this double team is coming at you? Uh, check opposite. You know that most the double team is going to come from the help side, which is middle most of the time. So yeah. that opposite skip pass is usually the one that's there or the one closer to the baseline if that man doesn't rotate down fast enough. So yeah, there he is. So my initial thought is to create space so that I have enough space to pass the ball and make a decision, give me enough time just to slow the game down a little bit. Right. And after that, you know, it's decision making. You know, you got three options. That guy's most likely going to be choked at the key. And then you got three outlets. Yeah. So, I mean, like, it seems like this defender here initially does a pretty good job, right? Of kind of, you know, tagging that cover coming through, playing both of those spots. And I think it's impressive that you have the patience here when a double team is coming at you to kind of take a step back and survey the situation and not force anything early. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of are able to manipulate this guy up at the elbow. And that's just a really nice pass through this double team right there down to the block for the easy bucket. Is that something that you've always sort of had a good feel for, even dating back to your high school days and kind of being a facilitator for others and using your 
gravity is such like a good shooter as a big and as a post threat to be able to draw help and then find other guys? Yeah, I feel like that's something I take pride in, you know, being able to find my teammates when they're open with the times that the defense is paying so much attention to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you could, you know, definitely continue to bring this value when you get to the next level and be that sort of offensive hub that can come in on a, like a second unit, you know, set some ball screens, do run some DHOs, run some horn sets, and then have the vision to find open guys. And right here is just a really nice, uh, you know, you start in a pick and roll and it's kind of a short roll decision here where after you set this screen, you roll to the middle here. What's your read right in this situation when the ball is coming to you right now? What are you typically looking for in like the short roll here? Um, I'm checking corners. I'm checking ball side corner to see if that man helped over to me. And I'm checking the help side to see because we're always going to have somebody in that dunker spot. So right. if that man comes up like I did now, easy dump off to Kyle, but say uh, their guard, he, he's not there and he helped down on Kyle. That's easy spray to the corner. And then same thing, you know, that guard helps down. I could have hit Dre in, in that situation too, but Kyle had the easy layup. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I feel like a lot of teams are going to be expecting you to pick and pop a lot of the time because that, that's where you really thrive, right, as a scorer, right? I think maybe 80% of your pick and roll possessions that you finish end in a pop. So sometimes these short rolls will catch teams off guard, right, and you're going to be left with a lot of four-on-three situations where you can pick defenses apart from like the foul line area here. And it seems like you just have a really good feel for that. Yes, sir. Yeah. A lot of work with uh, state and just repetition. Yeah, exactly. Cause a lot of these have to be really quick split second decisions yeah. where the defense can recover. Right. So do you feel like through throughout your career at Ohio state, you've gotten progressively quicker in making these decisions in a timely manner and having them be the correct decision? Yeah, yes, sir. Like, like every, like all the old heads say, you know, the game slows down as you as you keep playing. So, yeah. just going through the reps with Ohio State and then breaking down that film and them showing me Coach Holt and Coach uh, Peden, just showing me that the spots on the floor that are going to be open, you know, that really helped me. Yeah, absolutely. So you do a good find job of finding that empty space and then making the play. Yeah. Now here, I think we're going to get into your uh, actual pick and pop prowess, right? Because this is what opens up a lot of things for you is. Like I said, like 80% of your pick and roll possessions and you end up popping and you were a 42, 43% three point shooter this year on over a hundred attempts, which, you know, that's a pretty significant amount of volume for a big. So, you know, with you being such a big guy, uh, how did you become so comfortable as a shooter and, you know, become such a viable pick and pop threat? Cause I'm sure when you're really young and you're such a big kid, you know, a lot of your youth coaches are probably tempted to toss you down on the block and tell you not to work on that stuff out on the perimeter, right? How did you become, like, so comfortable as a shooter? Um, It started just while I was younger, mid-range shots. You know, I was effective at a mid-range shooter, and I thought that that was good enough. But as, you know, you got to – as the game gets better, as the players you're playing against get better, you got to expand your game a little bit. And so – Going into Ohio State, I was an okay three-point shooter. I mean, I, I could hit it. You'd have to guard me out there. But yeah. um, just the confidence the coaches gave me actually really helped, telling me that they wanted me to shoot more shots like that because they saw what they saw I had potential in shooting at a high level. So just them telling me, giving me the green light to be able to shoot through the game, you know, that really helped me. And that's what I worked on all through the, throughout the summer. Yeah, and you can definitely tell that it paid off and tell that you keep getting more and more comfortable. You see your shot mix year to year keep kind of like gravitating toward more three-pointers, less two-pointers, and like that's a modern style of play, right? Every team wants a big who can stick it from deep and can kind of force the other team's rim protector away from the rim because your ability to like draw people out here is going to open up a lot of angles for the rest of your team as well, right? Yes, sir. So definitely love to see that. So you can make those plays as a passer, but also stretch the defense out like this. And I think we've got maybe one more offensive clip here as well, which comes back to your playmaking again. You want to maybe talk me through what you're thinking right here as uh, your guys dribbling around the perimeter. It seems like pretty early on you have it in your mind to seal this guy off, right? So what, what's going through your mind and what's kind of the play and read here? Uh, most guys try to front me to prevent me from getting the ball. So yeah. just being able to hold my ground 
at a high spot to where my guard has the ability to throw it over and not worry about that help defense. That's going to come from the baseline. So I'm anticipating that help defense coming most right. of the time. And it doesn't come as easy layup, but they end up coming. And I mean, they can only come from one spot. If we're going to have a guy in the slot, it got to come from the corner. Yeah. And so that's mostly where my eyes go is opposite. Again, once the double team comes and found a win for easy shot in the corner. Yeah, so when you see this guy, like you said, you're anticipating it coming from here. When you see him kind of just fly by you and miss that deflection, are you kind of immediately thinking, like, zip it right to the opposite corner, that's what's going to be there? Because you know that's where he's coming from. Yeah, that's the the rim. You know, first look is the rim. But since he got the position, but I see that somebody else is helping off EJ, and he's down, so I have to go corner. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, that's a, just another really high level read there. And, you know, obviously at the NBA level, you're not going to have as many mismatches in the post, right? Like there's going to be plenty of guys that are big and athletic and can maybe put up a little bit better of a fight. But, you know, if you're able to seal people off like this, you're still going to be able to create these kind of instances where teams do have to come and help and double, right? And, yeah. you know, having that vision to see all over the court, from, whether it's from the block or from up on the elbows or wherever you're operating from, I think can add a lot of value offensively at the next level for sure. So now we're going to move to a potential improvement area on the offensive end. And I think this is going to be finishing at the rim and getting just a little bit more explosive in your sort of gathers and attacking the rim, right? Um, If you look at your percentages the past couple of years from two point range, you see it kind of go down year over year. You were shooting 56 per, uh, I'm sorry, 58% from two, then 55%. And now this year, like 46%. And yeah. part of that maybe being that you're taking more jump shots than you were early in your career. Right. But also I think, you know, you're a big, strong dude. Maybe you could stand to like use that strength and physicality a little bit more to your advantage when you're getting to the rim like this. Right. Yeah. Is that something you're working on now during your pre-draft process? Yes, sir. For sure. You know how I attacked his top foot there, just being able to cut him off. You know, even then I can slow the game down even a little bit more. If I cut him off and keep him on my hip for a little bit longer, it takes me, gives me time to even make a read out of it, out of help, or like you said, get to a stronger position off two feet or even one foot for either a floater where I don't have to get all the way to the rim or just something like a lay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is a pretty good initial move off the face up, right? Like you are a good shooter. Like we were talking about, you give the little pump fake and rip and you kind of have them right here. This looks good, right? It looks like you have an alley to the rim, but then kind of bring it back to the right hand there and kind of get met at the rim by two guys. Exactly what you're saying. Maybe just adding a few more little counters to your game to be able to knock down a little floater or just use your physicality and like, plan off two feet, go back into them, get to the free throw line because you're a good free throw shooter, right? There's a lot of different ways that I think you can leverage the skills that you do bring to the table to become just a little bit more of a strong finisher at the rim, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you have gotten sick of this throughout the entirety of your basketball playing career with guys trying to line you up for a charge, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's just one that, you know, I don't think this is necessarily all that bad of a play. But again, if you're just, you see right here, what do you think you could have done better in this situation? Oh, yeah, Kyle's getting that. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in any situation, Kyle's getting that. You know, I was, that game, you know, he played hard. You know, he made a good play on the ball. Yeah, and I'm sure that, you know, when you're faced up against other elite Big Ten big men, like there's a lot of great big men in your conference. And, You know, you run this little pick and pop, get a Turu to bite on your pump fake. All of this is great, right? That was awesome. So I'm sure after that, you're like, all right, I just pumped Oturu. I'm about to get get a bucket here and kind of bring us back into the game. But, you know, you recognize it, right? Little dump off pass there, avoid the charge. I know you have that in your game. And like we talked about earlier, you're an awesome passer. So, you know, just getting a little comfortable, like facing up and attacking the rim and making plays off that, right? I think this might just be one more instance of this as well, where you drive left. I see you kind of try to get into his body a little bit and do a floater like we were trying to to talk Mm -hmm. about last time. So not a bad attempt, but just getting more reps with that and getting more comfortable, right? 
know, even more balance, you know, going off one foot, maybe getting to his body more, go off two foot, give me ability to make a read or even shoot it even more. Yeah, exactly. So that's just something very minor offensively that if you just keep repping that out and keep working on, feel pretty confident that you'll be able to make some growth there. And that's not, you know, not going to be like a weakness in the pros, but just another way for you to add even more value and keep opening things up for you offensively. So now we're going to go to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Before we get there, how would you describe yourself as a defensive player? Like, what do you think you bring to the table? What do you think you do well? Uh, I feel like I'm an underrated defender, actually. I feel like I affect the game on a defensive end more than people think. Um, I feel like I'm a good help defender. You know, I'm a, a team defense defender. You know, I feel like I play great team defense. And I, the system, I always follow the system. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. You're a pretty smart off-ball help defender making those reads down on the baseline. And I think you're a pretty impactful rim protector in that role, right? You do a really good job, whether you're blocking the shot or not, of kind of deterring guys as they get to the rim. And what we're going to see here is we're going to focus on some of that. So this time you're on ball, maintain really good verticality here. I think this was Xavier Tillman. You want to maybe speak to when someone gets you kind of, uh, you know, ISOed out on the wing here and tries to drive on you. What's your sort of mentality in this situation? What was the scouting report against Xavier Tillman here? And what are you trying to force him to do in this situation? Well, in this situation, you know, Xavier, he got a, he has a mid-range jump shot, so, you know, you have to guard him up there. So him giving me that jab baseline, you have to bite for it. Yeah. Even a little bit, or he's just going to go. So I bit, and then I had to recover, and I knew that, I mean, most likely he's not going to go into one dribble and then pull up for a jump shot. He's going to try to get all the way to the rim for a hook or a layup. So being able to meet him at that spot after the recovery, I feel like. Right there, yeah. A lot. It helped me a lot to be able to get my chest on him and affect his shot. Yeah, absolutely. And like, he's a big, strong dude too, right? But like, you have the strength advantage over even him. It seems like in this situation, you take that physicality, stay straight up, so you make sure you're not fouling him and getting him to the line, and then are able to still impact this. And that's that's a tough shot, right? You you live with that one. If you can force guys into these tough, um, you know, opposite hand hook shots where they're a little bit off balance. I think you live with that every time. And I think this is just great defense in this particular instance and knowing personnel, right? So we'll move on to the next play after you pull down this rebound. You're matched up against Minnesota again. And I think what we're touching on here is that you do a really good job in drop coverage against pick and roll. So they set this, you drop here. What's your kind of uh, what's your kind of read here? Are you just kind of hanging out there at the elbow, trying to cut him off till your guard can recover and then bounce him back? Yeah, but I also have to make sure that um, Aturo doesn't get lower than me. Right, that's another you know because if he gets behind me, then a guy with his athleticism they're just going to throw it over top and he's that's a dunk. So right. making sure that I keep, I keep both of them in my peripheral vision to make sure I can I can play him and know where my man is out on the closeout, even if my other guy has to X out to him when I have to hit the right. corner man. Yeah, absolutely, right? That's that's a great way of describing what all the reads are and rotations in this situation. And you play this perfectly here, right? Your guard gets kind of caught up on the screen and is off balance. You stay there long enough to deter the little pull-up jump shot there. And then you have quick enough feet to get back out here to Oturu, tries to attack you off the bounce. Uh and you just do a great job of walling up here again, and that's that's a tough shot, right? Again, a lot of times defense isn't getting the blocked shot or anything. It's forcing someone to take an ill-advised low percentage look, and I think you do a really nice job of forcing people into uncomfortable situations like this. Mm-hmm. So now I think we might have one more of these this time. You kind of help out. This is a similar one, right? But this time it seems like even more so than with Oturu that you really know personnel and know the scouting report here, right? So you, again, cut off this guard. You press out a little bit more on this guy here, right? Yeah, he was he was starting to heat up a little bit later on in the game. So. Right, so more of a hard show rather than dropping a little bit in this one. Yeah. So you're able to play multiple styles of pick and roll defense, right? And yeah. this time you get you point it back out. I like the communication. Do you 
do you take a lot of pride in being like sort of a vocal leader and an anchor of a defense that's calling out different rotations and switches and yeah. just like helping your, your team defense in that way? Yes, sir. Cause you know, the, the big man, most of the time we're, we're the lowest guy on the floor. We see it all right. as far as the defense can go. So just being able to tell guards, like when screens are coming, cause you know, they're chasing guys throughout the whole game, you know, they're tired. They might not see the screen coming. You just got to tell them. Yeah, for sure. The communication aspect is huge. And then here, I mean, look how far you drop into the paint on this one. So this must be a scouting report thing. I would imagine he's, you know, he's not shooting that. Right. Yeah. So good job again of knowing personnel. Cause I'm sure sometimes when you hard show out onto a guard like that, you know, your first instinct might be to scramble as fast as you can back to your guy, but you maintain your principles here and get into the elbow and know, you know, that's the smart place for you to be on defense. Right. Yeah. And then when you're matched up against a non-shooter like this and know they want to drive, you know, sometimes it can be tough when certain players, if you give them that much space, they can kind yeah. of pick up some momentum and that can actually help them on their drives. What, what do you do to combat that? You just have to find the right, the right length, the right distance, you know, between your man and the basket. And where, you, I mean, if he's right hand or he's left handed, you got to know, I mean, which way he wants to drive and if he can finish with his left and his right. So that also helps out which way you're going to force him. Yeah, absolutely. So here, you kind of know that he's going to ultimately defer to go yeah. to his right. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, you know, that's coming the whole time and you're able to just kind of beat him to that spot. And again, I think similar to the Tillman play earlier, we see that you maintain really good verticality here as well, right? Just straight up, mm -hmm. not going to let him draw a foul, not going to bail him out, force him into a really, really tough shot again. So, I think that's what stands out the most to me about you on defense is that you're a smart player and you have a good sense of like pushing guys to areas on the court or situations that they're not really accustomed to making plays at or making their looks more difficult than they want them to be. So this time's a little bit longer of a possession, which I think early on you're matched up against someone else and then end up switching on to TJD here. Right. Or if, uh, yeah. You want to maybe talk me through kind of what's going on from the top of this possession and what you're sort of reading and reacting to here. Yeah. So I have to drop because uh, they're big role and then their four goes into the ball screen and pops. Yeah. So my four, has to, he has to hedge that because on the sides we hedge. So we force yep. him to the half court. I have to, I'm the lowest guy. So I have to X out and I have to depend on my bottom guy to get my man. Yeah. And then him, like another says, scouting report, you know, he like he wants to go to his left hand and finish at the rim with his left. So yeah. making sure he's not comfortable doing that and not giving him enough space to where he can wiggle around and get back to his right for an easy layup. You know? Yeah, I mean this is this is just awesome, right? Like exactly what you said. You made the right rotation, trusting your teammates and communicating, right? Like you're helping here. You see this come around and then knowing your scheme here. I, well, I think maybe something that goes underrated to even start this right here is that you fight over top of this guy. He's trying to seal you off to start right here. You're able to like swim your way around and get in front of him for even just a second and then have the wherewithal to rotate afterwards. And he is super heavy left-handed. Like He's a really good player, but loves going to his left exactly like you said. So again, knowing personnel, you force him back to his right. He's uncomfortable. He travels and you're strong enough to keep them in front of you. Do you think that playing against like such high level bigs so consistently, again, here we have Jalen Smith, right? Another really good big man. That's going to be a, you know, probably late first round draft pick this year. Yeah. To what extent do you think being matched up against such a wide array of like really talented bigs that bring different skill sets to the table has prepared you for taking this next step to the NBA? Hugely, greatly. That's one of the reasons I picked the school that I did, you know, the competition. Being able to play at, at that high of a level against people who are going to be where I want to be. So, like you said, he's a different player from, from Xavier. You know, he's more of a jump shooter. He wants to get me more finesse and stuff like that. So, knowing that, being able to take away his catch and shoot, making him either go into a one dribble pull up or try to get all the way to the rim. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you hit the nail on the head there. And, you know, it's good to see you in this situation. He's like a pretty agile guy being able to slide with him in space after you take away the jump shot and again, not foul, right? So, yeah, that's a big difference matching up against Jalen Smith versus uh, Luca Garza versus an Oturu or a Tillman on a day to day basis. That's like a wide array of different skill sets. And you've shown an ability to be able to combat all of those in a variety of ways, which I think is really encouraging for when you take this next step. So the improvement area on defense I think we're going to talk about is, you know, on that last clip, you did a good job of keeping uh, Jalen Smith in front of you and moving your feet. But every once in a while, I think you can get a little bit uh, like planted and guys can beat you uh, off that first step and get around you to the bucket. So here we see, you know, just kind of whips himself around you. He ends up missing the layup when it's all said and done. But you know, you want to maybe speak to in this situation, like what you could have done better to kind of seal him off and keep you in front of you here. Try not to guess the play. You know, yeah. Nebraska, they run a lot of wheel stuff. We're weaving in and out and they use their big man to initiate it. So yeah. when he faked like he was giving it to him, the whole game, he'd been giving it to him. So I'm, I cheated out trying to make sure the guard didn't get past my four man. And then, yeah, I got beat. Yeah, and so that's one of those things where your IQ almost got played against you, right? Like, you you know yeah. the scouting report so well. I remember, uh, you know, back when I used to play, running an ATO just like this after we would run a bunch of these, uh, you know, yeah. and so you can sometimes combat it with something like this. So, you know, just one of those things that, like, you know, you know the scouting report. You know what went wrong there. So not really a big deal. Just trying to over-anticipate, right? Yeah. This time we're going to show you getting matched up against the guard on the perimeter. Uh, one thing that's going to, you know, ultimately end up happening sometimes when you're in the NBA is it's a really switch-heavy league. Uh, yeah. You're going to every once in a while be caught on an island against these smaller guards. Have you been working on kind of like opening up your hips and quickening up your feet so that in those, you know, instances where you do have to guard a quick twitchy guy out on the perimeter that you're able to stay in front of him a little bit better? Yeah, that's a lot of stuff we work on with my strength and conditioning coach now. You know, just like I said, the mobility aspect of a lot of body weight stuff, getting quicker, being able to move my, my body efficiently. Yeah, and like you're, you have decent feet, right? Like you're, you're pretty nimble. Like you, on the offensive end, you have a lot of craft. Like I think you have decent feet. It's just, just getting more comfortable using them on the defensive end, out on the perimeter like this, and just beating guys to their spots, right? Yeah, yeah I just yeah. Go ahead. Another, another one of the things that kind of got me here, personnel wise. You know, they said he wants to shoot uh, shots late in the shot clock. He want to shoot pull ups. Yeah. So another thing, I thought he was shooting a pull-up. He hit me with a head fake. He got me. I bit on it. Yeah, and, like, I think, you know, it's probably, you know, you kind of do shut them down on the first instance of the play, and when they reset, to your point, the shot clock is winding down. So, like, I understand kind of getting a little bit overzealous on the closeout right there, right? You kind of yeah. jump, extend a little bit on the head fake. But, you know, ultimately – ends up with a wide open bucket. So just getting yourself a little more accustomed to garden guys out on the perimeter here. And I think this one here, you're get, we're going to see that this might be a scouting report thing as well, right? Like this guy may be a non-shooter, so you're staying back. Uh, so not necessarily even you doing the wrong thing in this play, but all we're pointing out here is that when you get to the NBA, most guys that catch this out on the wing, even if they're four or five, they're going to be able to stick that. So you, know, you might have done the right thing in your scouting report in this game, and maybe you live with that shot two minutes into the game, make them make one, right? But when you get to the NBA, most guys are going to be able to stick it, so you're going to end up spending a lot more time out on the perimeter. And, yeah. you know, getting more comfortable with that, I think, could go a long way in kind of cementing your value on the defensive end in addition to the things that we know you do so well as, like, an off-ball guy protecting the rim. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So that's all I've got uh, on the film end there. Really uh, enjoyed hearing your perspective on how you see the game and 
you know, your IQ is very evident, you know, both in just watching the film and digging into it on my own. And it's even more exemplified by hearing you actually talk through it right here in this capacity. So definitely appreciate your perspective on all that. And I'm sure that, you know, as you're interviewing with NBA teams, that's going to come off to them as well, that you really know the game, you're a student of the game, and you really like understand, you know, the inner workings of schemes on both offense and on defense. Yes, sir. Thank you. So before we wrap up here, um, you know, like we were talking about, you're not really going to get the chance to like be in person with teams throughout this pre-draft process, but I just wanted to give you the platform right now to address all those teams out there that may be considering drafting you. So who is Caleb Wesson? And if a team was to bring you into their organization, what can they expect from you both on and off the court? On the court and off the court, they're going to expect a hard worker, you know, someone who's going to come in there every day and give their all, you know, a guy who can, has the ball skills in the DHOs, you know, has the ball skills to initiate offense, you know, high level shooter, uh, high level passer, you know, just somebody who's a smart defender. You know, a lot of guys, you know, don't have the IQ. And I feel like I take a lot of pride in my IQ. Just know, like you said, knowing the game and being able to the game. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I mean, I, I think I can certainly envision you taking that package of skills that you just outlined right there and that IQ and kind of functioning in a way like almost like a second unit Jokic type role, right? Like what Jokic does in Denver you know, working out of the high post, running, pick and pops, facilitating for others. Like, I think that, you know, you could kind of come into a rotation and kind of add similar qualities and dimensions to an offense like that and be sort of a, a little bit of a hub and creator for others in a variety of ways with screening, with gravity, with passing vision, all that sort of stuff. And then being smart on the defensive end, like you said. So, you know, really excited to see where you ultimately land in this process and uh, excited to see how the pre-draft and the draft play out for you. And just, you know, looking forward to the beginning of your pro career and we'll definitely be rooting for you, Matt. Yes, I appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Best of luck. Stay safe, man. Yeah, yeah you too.